morning. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And I've titled my talk, The Past is the Future. This decade is purported to be the decade of India. And we're expected to be the third biggest economy by the end of this decade. We've made considerable strides in the field of development, infrastructure, defense. Mukesh Ambani purported to the fact that we are now the number one digital data company from being 158 eight years ago. Under the leadership of the present polity, we have achieved many firsts, landing the uh, spacecraft on the southern pole of the moon, the Mars expedition, numerous kilometers of network, development of indigenous capabilities both in defense and infrastructure. And clearly, medicine has not lagged behind. We have made considerable progress in the medical field as well. We have made progress largely in preventative and diagnostic capabilities and also in the implementation area. What is important to understand is that somewhere we seem to be missing a trick. If you go back historically to our country's past, you had Vagabhat, Aryabhat, you had Sushruta, you had Charaka. They were the doyans, they were the teachers, they taught the world medicine. And today we are trying to reinvent the wheel. So I think it's important to understand that in order to better the world, science has first of all to better itself. And the past to the future is the philosophy, it is the ethos, it is the belief. And it's important to understand that we do not repudiate the past just because it's old. Some of the principles that were taught by our seniors, the gurus, Sushruta for instance, hold true even today. It's also important to understand when we look at the complexity of evolution, not only in the medical field, but in other areas as well. There are numerous mysteries of the past that have been unraveled, but not understood by the intelligentsia of the modern world with all its available tools at their disposal. And evolution has largely evolved, and this is really something that I believe very strongly, around the simplicity of the mind, if you keep your mind simple, and understand the complexity of the targets and challenges, and you try to understand that, you get a better handle at what you're trying to achieve. Look at this. This is ancient Bharat. This is going back almost before Christ. And they talked about cloning, and they talked about test tube babies, which is today the buzzword. You go to any center, you have fertility centers. They're strewn all across. We talked about it 2,000 years ago. We also need to understand that we are trying to reinvent the wheel in a lot of spheres and dynamics. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. In our domain, the large areas of development have happened in the realm of diagnostics and preventative and therapeutic modalities. We're talking about genomics today. You would be interested to know that today, when a person is born, any one of us in this audience can get a buccal mucosa, which is a little scraping from the inside of your mouth, and that can give you your entire life profile better than your astrologer or your kundali can tell you. It can tell you what's, what diseases you're likely to have. And you're likely to be able to take preventative steps if you're intelligent enough. It's also important to understand that when we look at development, we do not look at it as a unipolar. There are technologies, there are techniques. We talked about AI, we talk about augmented reality. And now I'm uh, refining my uh, ambit of spread of my talk within orthopedics. And when I talk about orthopedics, I'm a joint replacement surgeon, I do knee replacements, and I'm narrowing it down even further. We talk about infections, which is one of the key challenges that we face. 
You'd be interested to know in this audience, all of you think you're healthy, believe you're healthy. Let me tell you, you're not. You're not. Surprised? The reason for that is each one of us in your gut, in your oral, your mouth, your nasal passages, have hundreds and millions of bacteria which are potentially lethal, dangerous, and on a stimulus can kill you. Why do we not have that? Because the triggers are not activated. And that is why there's a trigger for each one of us. Suddenly something happens, you develop infections, you do six surgeries on the same day, you have one patient who gets infected, one who does not, and they're all pre-screened. The reason is something triggers that bacteria to, uh, to help uh, escalate that potential of infection. So we started doing knee replacement surgeries. Uh, I was trained in England. I was very blessed to have been trained by the two fathers of joint replacement surgery, both in England and in, the Ameri in, in, the, in New York, in the United States. Uh, they uh, were my gurus. And when I came back to India, we had the most primitive form of uh, options available to us. This is what I started off with, gentlemen and ladies. Uh, the two uh, figures you see in the middle are actually made out of teak wood that was carved by a very, very talented carpenter. This is all the instrument we had. And we started doing knee replacements with this and a Black & Decker saw. So I'm very, very pleased to say that one of those patients we did in 1987 at the age of 31, just passed, after 31 years of successful surgery, died very recently. So old is not necessarily bad. Around that time, there were various technologies that were thrown in. We embraced it. We also had the occasion at that point of time to start treating a lot of uh, our sportsmen, some of whom actually come from your neighborhood from Jharkhand. I'll talk about three of them uh, with, with whom I have a particular affinity. The first was uh, one of the four world champions we have had in badminton, Polela Gopichand. We operated on him, um, and after about six to eight months of his, of his surgery, he went on to win the All England champ Championship. That was probably the only time in the world, in, in, my, in my lifetime, that I could say that I have beaten the world champion in badminton, I had two hands, two legs. He had one leg, and he could barely move. But I still take credit for beating, be, beating the world champion. The second was a very eminent Indian soccer player, captain by Cheng Bhutia. And the third, whose name I uh, humbled not to mention, was one of our Cargill heroes. And this is particularly relevant because we did his uh, ligament surgery, and I can tell you, for those of you who may be aware, knee surgery is a very painful surgery, and we did this boy's surgery. He was uh, captain in the Indian Army. Eight days after his surgery, there's a knock on my door in the clinic. He walks in in his full olive green, battle green, complete with his, and he says, Jahan, sir. I said, uh, what, what on earth are you doing? He said, sir, war's broken out. I've got to go to my boys. And he said, it's nine days after your surgery. And he said, sir, I'd be with my boys on one leg. He went, performed his heroics, and sadly laid down his life for the country. And that surgery was done without technology. What I'm trying to really emphasize in all these three cases, the common trend was not so much technology, it was mind, it was focus. And it was the belief that we were able to instill and they were able to instill into their own bodies that they could do it. So technology, no question, has a role. And this circle that you see, the, the, the one that I put, this is pretty much the entire ambit of knee replacement technology that is available anywhere in the world, from those little basic instruments to robotics, and we do a lot of robotic surgeries today. So come forward, this is some of the technologies that we have. 
This is a technique where we can actually perform the surgery on a computer before even touching the patient. I know exactly what I have to do. Just fit these blocks and go ahead and do it. There are other options that are available. For me, the most defining moment was I was selected. I was one of the uh, first uh, surgeons from this part of the world to be selected to a very august group of uh, surgeons. We were 26 of us, and we developed a new knee system. Proud to say this has actually been implanted in over 2 million patients worldwide since its launch in 2013 and continues to do very well. Again, the, these were knees that were implanted just by basic techniques, not technology, not artificial intelligence, not robotics. But they continue to do really, really well. We also, in our ambit of growing further, embraced technology in an intelligent way, trying to understand that at the end of the day, it is you as a surgeon, the humane, the human touch. How many of you would like to have a surgery done by a machine that you cannot talk to? You've all experienced the frustration of dialing an American Express number and saying, Hindi ke liye ek dabaiye, Angrezi ke liye teen dabaiye. For credit card details, press five. You pull your hair out and then it says, we'll call you back. You do not want that sort of a technology. You want a human technology. And in the field that I work in, I'm a surgeon. I deal with patients. Oftentimes, things don't go well. And you want to have somebody who you can hold your hand, who can, whose family can come, talk to you, cry on your shoulders. So technique and technology are two sides of the same coin. Both are important. But you need to understand what is more important for you. The game changer for us in terms of technology has been this, the next gen sequencing. And for those of you who may not be familiar with this, this again is a genome distribution. So today we can actually get in, when there's an infection, we can isolate the, the bacteria or the virus, get into the DNA of that, and we are able to now decode and find which antibiotic will work. So these are more preventative and uh, augmented ways of dealing with these infections. This is called the microbiome. This is what I was talking to you, the collection of all microorganisms uh, residing in our bodies, in our, on our skin, oral cavity, the genitalia, the gut, the respiratory tract. And they have been there since you evolved, since mankind evolved, the immune system evolved. But they are living in synergy, and this is called a holobiont. So this was an editorial in one of our very leading journals, Robotics and Orthopedic Surgery. Is it the end of surgery or its future? And it's, I think it's a very, very relevant question. Cut back to the past. This is our past. This is the Kailasa Temple in Ellora. 300 feet long, 175 feet wide, carved out of a 100 foot cliff with no instruments other than chisel and a hammer. Interesting part is most orthopedic surgeons are happiest and most comfortable using chisel and a hammer. We are carpenters that carve bones. So gentlemen and ladies, or should I say ladies and gentlemen, get the profiles right. What I would like to sort of end is a word of caution by the father of uh, artificial intelligence, Jeffrey Hinton. He resigned from his hallowed position in Google for two reasons. He said he did define the, the profile of uh, calibrations of the neurological system of uh, computers and robots and professed that we're getting to the stage where the robots are actually going to be more intelligent than men. And that can be a worrying concept. And finally, this man, you may not know of him, but Bob Booth is one of my very dear friends, a mentor to me, and arguably one of the finest orthopedic surgeon in the world. You were impressed with me when I said I done 55,000. This man just retired at the age of 80, having done 78,000 knees, and he's the god of, of uh, joint replacements. And this is his statement. I write to him once every month, and he said, 
buddy, robots are creating a chaos. Robots creating a whole new epidemic of imbalanced needs since everyone believes robots make them a better surgeon. In conclusion, I think it's a fair comment to say you can have a robot, but you still need to have that human mind, a human mind that has a human brain, and hopefully a more humane brain. I'd like to thank you all for our patient listening, and it's been an honor and a pleasure and a privilege speaking with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>